Лабадина, добрый день, good afternoon, добрый день, доброго дня. Uh, we are about to begin our four o'clock part of the program, a uh, conversation on the Russian opposition and the war in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, today, uh, my name is Grzyna, as m most of you probably know me as Grzyna from Facebook. Um, and I will be moderating uh, this discussion. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, to you our two panelists, um, who are both members of the Russian opposition. And uh, Ilya Bodraitskis is um, a political and social theorist who was previously based in Moscow. Uh, he regularly contributes to various venues on uh, politics, art, and philosophy. And he also teaches at the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences. And Ilya also is, uh, an, uh, is the author of a book that's out in the press as of last year, uh, Dissidents Among Dissidents. Uh, so Ilya is going to talk a little bit about uh, the United Russian uh, ideology as well as uh, the um, history and context of the Russian opposition. And our other panelist is Lola Nordic, and she's the founder of uh, Feminists Against War as well as the coordinator of Feminist uh, Anti-War Resistance. That is an international movement uniting feminists uh, across many countries. Uh, she uh, currently resides in Vilnius and moves along um, uh, across various uh, states, especially in the Baltics. And uh, Lola today is going to talk to us about um, what is feminist about the opposition, as well as how we could understand the rise of opposition and especially leftist feminist uh, wing. So without much further ado, I pass on the mic to Ilya. And uh, the, the format, probably I should say, of this discussion is going to be as follows. Uh, Ilya is going to talk to us for about 30 minutes and give us a short lecture. Uh, Lola will follow. And then we're going to have a full hour for questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions, hold on to them and we will make sure to um, answer all of them as we get, move into Q&A. Uh, Ilya, our pleasure. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, in fact, we we discussed with uh, Lola about how to uh, to manage this uh, this panel, and uh, Lola will mostly focus on uh, on the anti-war movement, on the Russian opposition, and I um, want to provide more kind of brief view on the let's say the main question that that is still with us uh, from uh, from the uh, end of february this year uh, why uh, why it happened why russia started this uh, this terrible terrible war i uh, i want to say that uh, until the last moment i was among let's say the majority of the activists, uh, researchers, so on, uh, and so on, who uh, didn't believe that is possible. Because this full-scale uh, invasion, this uh, full-scale uh, full sc uh, war, uh, look as a, as a kind of uh, something un uh, unimaginable, Im even from the, uh, let's say, rational reasons, rational expectations uh, from, uh, from the regime. And uh, after it happened, uh, after a huge uh, shock that we uh, already, uh, that we all of us uh, had in that uh, moment, uh, I was starting to think, I was starting to think why, uh, why it happened, what was the reason, uh, what was the reason behind it. Uh, of course, uh, now you have uh, various types of explanation, uh, uh, and uh, always uh, you can hear that it happened because of uh, because of some security concerns of Russia. It happened because of uh, NATO moving to the borders of the country, uh, and so on. 
So uh, I strongly believe that uh, this explanation is uh, totally wrong. It's totally wrong, uh, basically, uh, because the security concern uh, could be recognized if you already have a kind of rockets, a kind of uh, foreign uh, troops, uh, NATO forces on your border. If you have uh, just an idea, uh, just an uh, just, uh, image in your imagination that uh, it could be possible, it's not a security concern. It's, uh, it's your uh, kind of uh, free <laughs> expectation. That's why, for example, when uh, Nam Chomsky uh, compared the current situation with the Caribbean crisis of the early uh, 60s, uh, he's, uh, he's totally wrong. Uh, because uh, in uh, Cuba, uh, in, the, uh, in that moment, there were already the, the Soviet rockets. So they were not in the, some kind of <laughs> field of expectations of the, uh, of the Americans. And that was the reason of this crisis. Uh, you have nothing like this uh, with, uh, with Ukraine. And uh, moreover, uh, when Finland and Sweden uh, joined NATO and uh, the NATO borders moved to, uh, you know, nearby St. Petersburg, uh, there was not so much security concerns in, in that moment. It seemed that the uh, Ukraine occupies much more important uh, place in the, let's say, political imagination of uh, Vladimir Putin than, uh, than Finland, for example. Uh, and um, I think that the true reason, uh, well, there are a number of true reasons for, uh, for, for this war. Uh, of course, uh, there is, um, uh, there is an external reason, the reason which lies in the field of the global politics, and uh, this reason could be defined as the uh, idea, which is very deeply rooted among the Russian ruling elite, that the whole post-Soviet space, uh, it's a kind of organic sphere of state interests of Russian Federation. So Putin claimed openly many times uh, that uh, the borders uh, between the post-Soviet countries uh, are artificial, they are unjust, and uh, uh, the uh, claim of Russia is somehow to, uh, to, to adopt it. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, just the question of Ukraine, but, but the question of the post-Soviet states like in general. You know? And uh, also you have a... a going back to our uh, discussion about Russian imperialism, uh, I, I, I will say that you should, uh, in, in this question, you should um, listen not uh, only to oppressed, but also to oppressor. You know, uh, Putin in his uh, public uh, speeches and his public addresses, he uh, express the uh, kind of the core of the uh, imperialist ideology. So it's, he is not just uh, act as, imperi as imperialist, but he also thinks and talks uh, like imperialist. And that is a kind of um, new quality of imperialism, which uh, <laughs> remind the explanations uh, before, I don't know, the First World War uh, in the very early uh, 20th century. Uh, behind these explanations, you have a clear world view that there are uh, subjects of the global politics, you have a real states, real powers, and you have a objects uh, who will be uh, colonies of someone else in one way or another. So if Ukraine is not a Russian colony, it, uh, it will uh, be an uh, American colony. So that is the whole uh, kind of imperialist worldview. It's a worldview of how the, you know, the global situation is organized in reality, not in the kind of hypocritic rhetorics of the West, but in reality. And Putin just follow this kind of 
uh, organic uh, essential law of the uh, of the global politics according to his own uh, according to his own understanding uh, following this uh, explanation you can clearly see how the imperialist ideology works uh, also in the in the openly kind of racist sense so you have a true peoples uh, and you have a artificial peoples so ukrainians according to uh, to this uh, worldview uh, is uh, is not a real nation is artificial nation so um, it should its very existence should be uh, should be dubbed in in uh, one way or another and i think we we should uh, take this uh, explanation seriously that is not uh, that that is not just rhetorics that is not uh, something that cover real uh, kind of uh, uh, rational economic uh, interests that is exactly how these people think that is exactly how they uh, see uh, 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 see the world and uh, in this sense, of course, the aim of, uh, of the Russian aggression to redefine the uh, post-Soviet sp uh, post space as a whole. Uh, that is the one big reason, one big project of this, uh, of this war from the side of the Russian government, uh, which is external. But also, uh, there is a very important uh, internal purpose. Uh, from the very beginning of this war, you see a rapid transformation of the political regime in Russia. You can see that uh, from some kind of uh, quality of, uh, let's say, uh, managed democracy or electoral authoritarianism, uh, Russia moved uh, to the quality of the open uh, dictatorship where the all kind of uh, expressions of alternative point of view and especially alternative points of view on uh, on this war uh, they are criminalized yes so if uh, before the war uh, in russia it was a clear uh, kind of division uh, cl clear border in between the uh, public life which was strictly controlled uh, and the private life where you uh, still had the right uh, you know to think whatever you want uh, for now this uh, this border disappeared so the uh, kind of your uh, your identity your uh, your citizenship your uh, duty as a citizenship uh, could be expressed only in the terms of absolute loyalty to the, let's say, national leader uh, and, uh, and, and his politics. And, of course, that is the very new quality of the Russian political uh, regime uh, that we can see after the, uh, start, uh, after the start of this war. So why uh, it was... Uh, it was so important for uh, Putin to, uh, to transform his regime in some way. I believe it happened because uh, he uh, was faced uh, the growing uh, crisis of his, political, uh, of his political system, of his political regime. And he was faced uh, the huge challenge of, let's say, politicization. Of the Russian society. If you look uh, back to all the, let's say, 20 years of history of Putinism, you can uh, clearly see the uh, kind of uh, phases, you know, of its evolution, of its transformation. So uh, if uh, in the first decade of, of this regime, in 2000s, uh, it was uh, mostly a kind of uh, non-ideological, uh, technocratic, managerial, uh, or uh, also you can say post-political. So the main message of this regime was that live your uh, private life, enjoy the economic growth, uh, and uh, stop 
any kind of interest in uh, uh, public sphere in in the politics uh, because uh, simply because it doesn't matter it's not uh, it's not related to your real uh, life which is pure uh, private kind of economic life which is a life guided only uh, by the interests of uh, you and your family yeah that's the horizon that should be horizon of your uh, interest and uh, that situation uh, that situation was was real it this message was working uh, until uh, the um, uh, year of 2011 uh, when uh, Putin was faced uh, the uh, rise of the protests uh, of Bolotna Square probably you heard about it so why this protest uh, protests uh, emerged why they uh, break this kind of uh, uh, depoliticized consensus in the Russian society uh, so of course it happened uh, because of the uh, because of the economic stagnation of Russia uh, after uh, the global economic crisis of 2000 uh, 2008 and also it happened because of the you know some kind of problems within the political machinery of so-called managed democracy in uh, in Russia which was perfectly working uh, before but uh, met some kind of uh, clear uh, clear contradictions from uh, from within so from uh, from his re-election to the third uh, term in the um, uh, early uh, 2012 uh, Putinism uh, presented its new face and this new face was not uh, this kind of post-political managerial uh, uh, face anymore but uh, it was the uh, something that you can define as the conservative term of the regime so the uh, majority that possibly supported uh, supported this regime uh, was not uh, constructed uh, anymore as the kind of passive uh, majority of uh, the people who enjoy their private life but it was constructed as a kind of silent uh, conservative majority uh, hard-working Russian Orthodox uh, homophobic uh, people uh, you know who believe in some traditional values uh, and who are united against uh, some kind of uh, some kind of um, uh, liberal minorities uh, who uh, who are trying to uh, to challenge their traditional way of life that was uh, that was a new figure new figure of consensus of the russian uh, of the russian society of the russian regime which uh, moved it uh, to more and more kind of authoritarian uh, authoritarian way uh, and i believe that uh, the annexation of crimea the russian intervention uh, in uh, in donbass in uh, 2014 were also a kind of answer to uh, to this um, uh, to, to this uh, movements uh, from below in the country who who were trying to uh, to change the uh, situation who were trying to change the system so in this way uh, the uh, um, uh, kind of uh, mode of war became uh, slowly uh, kind of organic way of how this regime exists and how it reproduces itself so war became more and more needed uh, also for the uh, internal purposes for the uh, you know kind of stabilization of the system which uh, which uh, was more and more faced with the possibility of uh, let's say destabilization of the inner uh, inner uh, crisis so uh, after uh, the the uh, annexation of Crimea the new uh, kind of uh, majority 
uh, was constructed uh, from the top, constructed ideologically under the name uh, of so-called Crimea, uh, Crimea Consensus. And Crimea Consensus means uh, not only consensus about certain set of traditional values, but also consent, consensus of the um, uh, kind of military consensus, uh, military, politically, military political consensus, uh, which uh, simply uh, means the identity in uh, between uh, between your you know citizenship and your uh, responsibility for the external politics of of uh, your uh, your country and and your government. So in this way, um, the uh, the very border in between the internal and external in the Russian regime became more and more uh, blurring. Yes, so. Any, uh, any kind of uh, movement for uh, the democratic rights, civil rights, and so on, were uh, immediately recognized as the, as the kind of expression of the interest of some, some kind of uh, external protagonist of, uh, of Russia. The, uh, the effect of this Crimean uh, consensus uh, was, uh, was not very long, actually. So I will say that to some uh, 2017, it became clear that uh, it's not working so uh, perfect anymore. Uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, again, uh, Russia experienced some wave of politicization. So probably you heard about the, um, the populist movement of uh, Alexei Navalny. Uh, you heard about the uh, mobilizations in Moscow and uh, in other uh, Russian cities. And what was, uh, what was new, what was uh, important, what was uh, uh, different in these mobilizations if we compare it with... Uh, with uh, the protests of uh, 2000, uh, 2011, that these mobilizations were not only uh, inspired by the um, ideas of, uh, let's say, political democracy and the uh, uh, equal political representation. Uh, they also uh, were inspired uh, with the feeling of the deep social inequality in the Russian society. So if you look to the, uh, to the message of Alexei Navalny in that uh, moment, which was uh, described as kind of anti-corruption message, uh, you can see that uh, the, the, uh, the topic of corruption just, uh, just cover something more, uh, more deep, something more serious. Uh, it covered the very uh, big and growing uh, social anger in the Russian society. The social anger uh, on the very kind of unjust, very unequal uh, society, the way how society in uh, Russia is organized. So uh, in uh, two, uh, um, uh, 2020, uh, Putin uh, proposed the uh, so-called amendments uh, to the um, uh, to the Russian Constitution, which um, which uh, didn't only uh, give him a possibility to run for the further uh, president terms, but they also, and, and that is much more serious, they also uh, destroyed the last elements of any kind of political institutions, uh, legal political institutions in the country. So after, uh, after this, um, uh, this uh, constitution uh, amendments uh, story, uh, in Russia, Putin became the kind of only real uh, political institute by himself. So he replaced the uh, institute of presidency, because before Russia was, let's say, authoritarian super presidential republic, now uh, it became a kind of the state which, uh, which is operating only by the personality of one man. And uh, the, uh, 
uh, the um, amendments uh, to the uh, to the constitution on uh, in in Russia just you know marked this uh, labeled this um, uh, this situation. So in this poor in in this way the uh, the start of the war uh, and uh, and the transformation of the political regime the political atmosphere. Uh, in the country towards the kind of open uh, dictatorship uh, was very logical. It very logically came from uh, from the uh, the whole the evolution of um, of this political uh, of, the, of this political regime. Uh, after the um, start of the uh, of the war, uh, we uh, saw a lot of debates. Uh, about uh, if if Put Putinism is a new form of fascism, and uh, of course um, this uh, you should be very careful about this uh, these debates, because the use of uh, F word <laughs> is something uh, is something very uh, very uh, it could be very dangerous. It could be very dangerous in a way because of its status of absolute evil. So if you call somebody. Uh, fascist. Uh, it means that uh, any kind of communication with this uh, person uh, is not possible. And also it means that uh, the very existence of fascist should be doubted. And that's the way actually how uh, Russian propaganda used the label of uh, fascism, Nazism uh, to, uh, promote, uh, to promote the uh, war uh, in Ukraine. The other uh, dangerous thing about uh, definition of fascism is uh, that uh, that is uh, usually described as something uh, something special, something unique, something that break uh, the you know our normality and present some kind of extraordinary uh, situation, uh, and uh, that also could lead uh, um, with our analysis of uh, Putinism as uh, fascism to some sort of exotization. So we can say that, well, you have all the civilized uh, world on one hand, and you have the uh, fascist, uh, the fascist Russia, um, uh, the fascist Russia on the uh, on the other. But I strongly believe that uh, the definition of uh, fascism could be. Uh, extremely useful and uh, important, uh, uh, especially with the explanation of this evolution of Putinist uh, state, if we look at it as the, uh, as the global phenomenon. If we look at the evolution of uh, Putinist Russia, its ideology, its political structures, uh, as so, and, and so on, not as the, as the rupture with, let's say, normality of the market society, but as the radicalization of some tendencies uh, that existed globally. Yeah? If we look at the Putin's fascism, not as something unique, but something very obvious. Uh, if you uh, even go into the rhetorics of Putin, uh, to the rhetorics of the current Russian state, you can't find uh, anything original there. You have the absolutely the same tropes of traditional values, uh, patriarchat, uh, homophobia, uh, chauvinism, and so on, uh, that, that are very, let's say, became a kind of uh, spirit of the, of the time, you know. Uh, and uh, when, for example, I described uh, this model of the, uh, you know, silent uh, Christian uh, patriarchal majority against the uh, homosexual, liberal, uh, cultural, uh, Marxist minority, uh, you can see that this kind of figure that was uh, just uh, imported, <laughs> you know, from, uh, from the vocabulary of uh, American neoconservatives and uh, bring to, uh, to Russia. In the, same, in the sense, uh, Putin is uh, totally, uh, I mean, eclectic and secondary <laughs> kind of type of... Uh, uh, type of leader, yeah. He uh, he uh, he doesn't use anything uh, that is not already existed in uh, some uh, some global uh, trends. Uh, and the last question uh, that I, I, I um, 
I will try to touch is the question of um, the role of, uh, let's say, mass mobilization uh, under fascism. Because uh, the very well known uh, explanations of fascism uh, define it from any other forms of authoritarian uh, regimes exactly in the way that you have the, uh, let's say, mass politicization, uh, mass indoctrination uh, into some kind of fascist ideology, fascist vision of the uh, future, which differed from uh, the uh, kind of depoliticized um, up, you know, authoritarian regimes. But I think that, and, and not just me, but uh, also a lot of uh, great uh, researchers, uh, thinkers on uh, fascism from, I don't know, Trotsky, Karl Polanyi, or even uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, who saw fascism uh, uh, completely in opposite way, who saw fascism not as the result of uh, mass mobilization, but as a result of mass atomization, as a result of the uh, melting of the society into this kind of atoms uh, of the uh, of the pure public uh, private uh, private life, and. That's, uh, that's how, uh, in fact, the Putinism, the, if we can define it as a new form of fascism, arises from the very uh, uh, kind of spirit of the, let's say, neoliberal uh, social transformation that happened in the, in, in the, recent, uh, in the recent decades. Of course, uh, in, uh, in post-Soviet Russia, this transformation had some specific features. Uh, it rooted in the, in the so-called shock therapy, in the market uh, reforms uh, of the 90s, and, uh, and so on. But um, generally speaking, uh, it's just a part, uh, just a one of the... Um, uh, one of the results of some some global uh, some global trends. That's why I think uh, it is relevant to talk uh, to talk about this fasci fascization of the Russian um, regime, uh, which is coming from the top, which which is coming not not from below, not as a as a kind of fascist movement. Uh, and uh, we should uh, treat it as a, as a kind of global, uh, global challenge, global danger. Uh, danger uh, who can come not only in the form of the Russian military expansion, which, which is possible, yeah? uh, because as I uh, explained already, this regime, uh, this regime could exist only in the form of the permanent uh, aggression. Uh, especially in the post-Soviet uh, post-Soviet uh, space, but uh, also uh, this new form of fascism could uh, come in very different forms. Yeah, and if we uh, can imagine, you know, the uh, I don't know the victory of Donald Trump in the uh, U.S. and transformation of American state according to the rationality of of, the, of this movement, or uh, the uh, uh, some trends of the right-wing uh, populism in Europe and so on, we, uh, we, we see the uh, Putinism as a, as, a, as a kind of possibility. Yeah, and that's that the reason why uh, it should be stopped, that's the reason why uh, Ukraine should be, uh, should be supported, and that's uh, the reason why we uh, should confront uh, these uh, uh, neo-fascist tendencies in any forms in your own society. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. That was a tour de force in 30 minutes. Uh, it, was, uh, it was phenomenal. Thank you so much for your insights. And uh, Lola, now it's up to you. Uh, and uh, would you please come back up? Okay, hi. Um, I'm very grateful for being able to be here. It's a lovely festival, and I met a lot of amazing people, and it's like, I love it. I love everything about this festival. Uh, so I wanted to correct a bit information about me. So there are 
was this misunderstanding. There is a feminist against war movement, but it's actually a European group. And I'm a co-coordinator of feminist anti-war resistance movement, which was um, discovered in Russia uh, the second day the war has escalated in February. And um, our movement is a horizontal feminist organization. The aim of the organization is to bring together and unite feminist, queer, leftist groups worldwide to confront this war and to support Ukrainian people and to fight against this war in Ukraine. So uh, I'm also a part of uh, different local feminist and queer communities in St. Petersburg when I was raised and I'm originally from St. Petersburg. Uh, right now I'm here because I had to flee Russia on March uh, 9 because I appeared to be uh, a suspect of a terrorism criminal case in Russia, uh, which is obviously fake. Like this is a mm, terrorism criminal case, which was completely made up by secret police in Russia, by FSB, to uh, block anti-war activists from their work and to scare others. So I'm not the one uh, figurant of this case. There are like many of them. And uh, like police broke into our houses, like in the middle of the night, broke our doors to call off our property, electronic devices. They arrested us for several days and then they let us out before the court. That's when I had to flee. Basically, I was evacuated by the international NGO to be able to protect myself from going to jail for up to five years. So uh, I'm going to speak about what we do as Russian citizens, as anti-war activists to fight this war and we do many things but uh, I've been in Europe for five months already and I can see clearly that it's not that obvious obvious for many people even from leftist society of like what does the Russians do with this war even though we do a lot and I think there's also a problem of I don't know hierarchy image like hierarchical thinking about the Russian opposition, because when you're speaking about opposition in Russia, everybody worldwide knows Navalny, but basically most of the people don't know any other organizations. And if you speak about feminism in Russia, everybody knows Pussy Riot. But other than that, you know, like uh, people know nothing, even though there are a lot of organizations. And I think it's really important to say that the war didn't start in February. I prefer to say that it has escalated in February because it started 2014 and a uh, very good question to discuss and I think maybe I can elaborate on this later uh, why there was no huge anti-war movement back then in 2014 because obviously there was anti-war protests and there was like a opposition tried to build this anti-war movement but I think worldwide not only in Russia it was like this Crimea story wasn't so clear for people because it wasn't a bloodshed at that time of course some people were killed at Donbass and everything but still it wasn't something like we see today and it was like it was difficult for some people to figure out what's like what can they do or can do with it but right now it is a completely different situation because we are really building an anti-war movement and a lot of people, like millions of people, are involved. And I, I always get questioned in Europe, like, is it true that like 70% or 90% of people in Russia are supporting the war? It's not true because this data comes from the official pro-governmental Russian sources, like official statistics, and you don't have real statistic in the authoritarian state which Russian Federation is because when you have a like okay Russia was an authoritarian state in my opinion right now we have like a military dictatorship already so it got really worse and when you are a citizen of this country and when a person calls you on a phone or comes to you in the street and said like what do you think about like the military special operation you don't know how what's the right answer you know like Will you go to jail or have problems if you say what you really think? But you know, but actually you know the right answer. You know the safe answer. And the safe, a safe answer is just to keep silent or to say that you support it. Because you know if you say 
what's truly on your mind that you don't support it or you're critical about the government, you may have, you know, problems in your life and in the life of your family. So uh, I can say that right now uh, there are two options for anti-war movement and anti-war activists in Russia to survive. One option is to continue the work in exile like I do. So I didn't stop my work and I like work mostly every day without weekends, coordinating anti-war resistance movement, helping people who are still in Russia, who are political prisoners, who are working underground in Russia, building like partisan anti-war uh, resistance movement. At the same time, helping Ukrainian refugees who sometimes have a really huge lack of help in Europe. And um, I lived uh, and I like work in Estonian organization called Friends of Mariupol. This is a completely grassroots organization which meets Ukrainian refugees who were basically kidnapped from the war zone by Russian military and brought to Russia by force. So there are millions of such Ukrainian peoples who were brought to Russia and now they don't know what to do. They Some of them try to escape, but most of them are so overwhelmed that they just stay in Russia and Russian government is interested in them staying in Russia because in that case they can manipulate these people and uh, like say things like that okay see there are millions of Ukrainian people that we saved from the war zone and now they're in Russia and we're helping them and so on so our Estonian organization we help uh, those Ukrainian people who got to Russia to plan their route and how to get out how to escape because it's not safe to any Ukrainian person in Russia right now because it's a like, state of aggression and uh, um, there is other problem that Russian officials, they try to make Ukrainian refugees to give up their Ukrainian citizenship and uh, take a status of a refugee, which is also rid ridiculous, like how can you be a real refugee in a country which murders your nation, which, which murders your people, but they try to make that move. So we are meeting refugees in Estonia and we are a grassroots organization and at the same time Estonian government like they do something but they don't do a lot and the and I have friends in many countries of Europe who some of them are Europeans some of them are Russian citizens in exile and they all do this you know unpaid volunteer work helping refugees and they don't see the officials helping much and they don't see the money and the question is like where are these millions of money which are raised in different i don't know red cross thing governmental organization because grassroots people don't see this money and we have to use our money to help ukrainian people so uh what i was talking about that one part of the work is being in exile and doing anti-war uh, resistance movement and fighting this war. And another thing is staying in Russia. But if you stay in Russia, the only option for you to uh, sustainably work as an anti-war activist is to go deeply underground, to go anonymous, to go partisaning, as a lot of people do. Because as you may heard, you can get arrested for anything in Russia right now. And it's completely unpredictable. You don't have to try to organize a public street meeting to get a criminal case against you. You don't have even to get out of your house to be called a terrorist like I did. So uh, like police can break into your house any second for a tweet, for an Instagram post, for you just showing up in the street with a, I don't know, yellow blue clothes on you or like Pacific sign or something. It's completely uh, unsafe and unpredictable. So if you want to do this work sustainably, you have to go underground. And we have a lot of people who are risking their lives right now doing this partisan underground work. For example, uh, we have an anarchist community, like a, a network all over Russia, who are stopping trains which bring military machines to the war zone. So they're basically breaking the railway, uh, the railways to stop uh, these trains from going and to slower this uh, war at some point and these people are risking basically they're not not only risking their freedom they're risking their, their lives because if you get caught trying to break the railway station you might get even shot because this is a huge crime to do uh, at the same time there are people who are putting this I don't know how to say like uh, offices when 
military offices where uh, young men come to join the army. So uh, those underground activists, they burn down these places. They throw Molotov cocktails to their windows in the night so it can, it can continue their work like after the weekend. So uh, these are the kind of dangerous work that is being done constantly in Russia and it, it's not like one or two cases it's many cases and it's like sustainable it's uh, it, it's it, it's going on for months at the same time we have organizations who provide legal help to people who were repressed and oppressed by the government which is also a very big big deal because if you face this system most of the people don't have money to uh, get a lawyer to protect them and not any lawyer will help you when you are like a victim of a political case. So we have such organizations like Over the Info and Apology of Protest who provide free lawyers to all these thousands of people who got under these repressions. And I need to mention this number because when the war has escalated in February, we had uh, street protests every day, I think, for a month in many cities, not only Moscow in St. Petersburg, which are the most like politically active, I guess, in terms of how many people participate, but all over the Russia. Every day, people went out to the streets with peaceful protests against this war, even though they knew what will happen to them, even though they knew that they can go to jail for a month or they can go with huge fines they can, that they can't comprehend or that they will have a criminal case against them. They did it because people were against this. People were shocked uh, from this news and nobody wanted it. I mean, like most of the people didn't, in my opinion. I also don't have a real statistic, so I can't say the numbers. But I mean, uh, it's really, you know, um, I think it's really important for European people to... Um, raise this awareness about like what is really going on in Russian anti-war resistance movement to dig into the uh, history of like independent communities and anti-war movements who are not popular who are not like well media covered as Navalny and his team and I mean like yeah that's the number thank you yeah it's the number that I wanted to uh, tell you about like after these two weeks of protest when the war has escalated, 16,000 people were arrested all over Russia. It's a huge number of people. And uh, imagine how other people felt when you know that 16,000 have already been arrested. That raises your chance of, like, if I go out on the street, I might be, the, like, the next one. And it's really important to know that, like, being able, like, being ready to be arrested is some kind of a privilege, <laughs> if you know what I mean, because... If you have kids and you are a single mom, you don't have that opportunity to be arrested, you know, in the single protest because there will be nobody to take care of your kid or your kid can be taken away from you by the authorities. Or if you have like elderly people in your family who you are taking care of, who will take care of them when you spend 30 days in jail? And if you are like not a really like you know rich person, as most of the people in Russia are, if you are a poor person, you can lose your job, you can lost, uh, lose your income while you are a suspect or arrested person. I personally lost my job last year. Like, I've been um, oppressed and, like, I had issues with secret police for a year and a half already. I had series of arrests and series of cases against me. So when they started going after me, uh, a place where I worked said to me, Oh, we love you. You're a great worker, but maybe you want to quit because we don't really want you to, you know, to make troubles for our company because we're scared that something will happen to our company and we can handle that. And there are a lot of obstacles to people to join this protest, but still they do. They still join and they risk everything they have. And these anti-war protests in February, they were super diverse. I mean, sometimes media likes to cover, especially pro-governmental media, I guess, like even speaking about Navalny protests, like, oh, there's only like st some stupid young students are protesting, some kids, they're like brainwash the kids, so the kids go protesting. No, it, not at all. 
we had like a lot of people. There were young students. There were people in their eighties protesting. There were people of different, completely different background going out in the street and protesting. And there were a lot of women. There were a lot of queer people protesting with their like their faces open, which is again a really serious matter because I think you all know what kind of attitude towards queer people is in Russia right now and for the last decade, I guess, because we have this law against like LGBTQ propaganda law, uh, which makes uh, queer people in Russia even more vulnerable group than it was before this law. So, and even these people, people from vulnerable groups, they got, they risked their safety and they got to this protest and they keep doing a, a large amount of more work in the movement. Uh, also, I wanted to say that uh, another part of anti-war movement is working with uh, mm, organizations that help uh, young men who can, like, m might be called to army to not to go there, because a lot of young men get tricked into going to army. Uh, I think you may be heard, uh, you might heard that. Uh, in the war zone, uh, there appear to be not only like professional soldiers and people who are contract soldiers, but also young boys who were just like temporarily doing their like uh, how conscription. yeah conscription, and uh, it's not legal for them to be in the war zone, but they send it to them there without their consent. And right now, as a lot of soldiers keep dying in this war, and there is a lack of uh, force. In Russian military, they try to trick people into going to army, and uh, at least they can't really. I at least by now they can't really force you to go to the army, but they mostly use different tricks to do so. It sounds stupid, but like it's actually what they do. For example, you're going to this military office, and they're just saying you, okay, just sign this another paper, and a lot of people are not that educated, and they have this, you know like the power dynamics, like this guy from the military, from the office, he knows what to do best, so I will just sign all the papers that he gave me. And and then you figure out that you're going to a war zone and that you gave them your consent. So we are having a system of grassroots NGOs and independent organization who educate people and who help people not to get into this trap and not to go to, uh, not to, go to army. And they explain to people that you will not go to jail if you don't go. There are some legal, still, luckily, there are some legal opportunities for you to reject this and not to go to the army. Also, we have the communities of mothers of soldiers who, I think mothers of soldiers is a really huge power in any war because they cooperate and they build their underground movements and they fight for their children and they fight... Uh, against all these tricks that government uh, try to pull their children in. Uh, at the same time, I wanted to say that students are another anti-war movement in Russia. We have an horizontal organization called Students Against War, and that those people risk a lot too, because all the educational system in Russia is fucked and completely under the boot of the government, of course. And if you are a student who is vocal about his or hers or they's anti-war position, you can be thrown out of the, the university. You have uh, you can have troubles with applying for new university after. So it can affect your academic career. It it can affect your destiny. It can affect anything. And still, students do this, and students get kicked out of the universities, and professor professors get kicked out for their positions. But People do risk, and they do this work, and they really need solidarity from people from other countries not to say general statements like, okay, most of the Russian are pro-war. First of all, it is not true. Second of all, the point is in these minorities and in these local communities and these grassroots anti-war movements who fight this war and who risk their lives and they really need solidarity and they need to be heard and visible from the people from other countries. For example, I mean, uh, right now we are hearing this thing about like that they want to cancel uh, visa opportunities for Russian citizens. Like Estonia already did it. They said like, okay, if you are a Russian citizen and if you had Estonian visa, we won't let you come to Estonia, even though you have visa. We don't want you here. Uh, 
Today, I read the news that Lithuanian government said that they support this decision of Estonia. What should I feel in this situation? Because I am having a Lithuanian visa right now. W will I be kicked out? Should I go back to Russia where I will go to jail? If I go back to Russia, I will definitely go back to jail. And I won't be able to do the work that I do uh, distantly that uh, affects this uh, war in Ukraine and helps activist community in Russia. And at the same time, I'm doing the work partly that European government doesn't do. For example, helping Ukrainian refugees and making these grassroots mutual aid systems here. But they are like saying that we don't want you here, any of you, we don't want to like uh, uh, know who is who has what position. And I think like for me, it's weird to be like here, I can be vocal about it, but it would be weird for me to do, you know, that kind of activism, like, no, you should give Russian citizens visas. I don't want to, you know, like it's not my priority right now. But I think maybe Lithuanian citizens or Estonian citizens and activists and leftist activists can be more vocal about it and say, okay, you need to support anti-war movement and to support them, you need to provide them options to relocate temporarily because uh, all the European governments are throwing in our face this asylum thing uh, and they say, why won't you apply to the asylum thing? Asylum, I don't know, whatever. But like, I don't know even one person from the activist sphere who wants to apply to this, because if you apply to this, you're basically becoming a hostage of a first country you entered after Russia. So if I entered Estonia, I can only apply in Estonia. And if I apply, it's a huge, stressful, traumatic, bureaucratic process uh, where you have to, you know, uh, like fight and you have to prove that you are actually in danger and you have to speak to all these official organizations, you have to be interviewed, you have to, all the time that could be spent to the anti-war work will be spent to this bureaucratic shit. And at the same time, you lose the ability to go back to your home country to fight when it's needed. Because if you apply for asylum, it's not that easy to skip it back. You can't just go here and there, back and forward. If you apply, you apply and you can like spend 10 years without being able to come back. But if you decide to come back, they will think that you tricked them and that you like lied to them. Because if you come back, it means it's safe for you to come back. So it's all fucked up. And the visas uh, seems more simple way, but they try to cancel it. And I think uh, there's really is a space for solidarity in these terms, because uh, blocking opportunity of relocating for activists is not helping anti-war movement. It, it only stops us from doing more work. And I know a lot of people who relocated for a couple of weeks, couple of months, like to lay low for some time, to rest after the tortures, for example, when people face them at the police station or in jail, and then go back to Russia, then go back in danger and continue doing the, uh, the work. There are a lot of people who do things like that. Um, I think the last uh, thing that I wanted to say is to say that Russian anti-war activists are not only Russians. They're like, we have a large amount of nationalities in Russia and we have different indigenous community who are fighting Russian state as an imperialistic state and who are building decolonial anti-war resistance movements in Russia. Uh, they are trying to bring up the issues of this colonial politics on Russia, like internal, because uh, Putin, as he doesn't think that Ukrainians have any right to be independent, and that they are a real nation, the same attitude from him and his government is towards the indigenous community in Russia and different nations who lived in Russia historically. And these people are also risking, like, even more because they are already a vulnerable group because they can get real problems with secret police just by stating that they need some independence or they need like to raise these decolonial issues. Only this, like I think the word decolonial is already a thing to be like a suspect of some weird uh, criminal case in Russia. And yeah, and when you're a decolonial activist and at the same time anti-war activist, it's, it's way too much, but and still people do this work. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you so much, Lola. Um, I think after having heard both Ilya and Lola, uh, if you are with me, you probably are in the same boat thinking that we have in a lopsided information society where only certain information makes it to the mainstream media. In many ways, we uh, are trapped in the cycle where um, it, which operates on the assumption that there is nothing new to be known about Russia and the present can be entirely explained by the past and that paradigms from imperial Russia fully explain the war in Ukraine and those cycles get perpetuated without ever being interrupted. So I think we can really appreciate Ilya's contribution to kind of rectifying and breaking in that cycle and sort of give uh, from moving Russia from a historical already known state to actually a state that has its own processes that are not uh, so unique as to say that Russia cannot be understood by reason and rather to see it as part of a global phenomena uh, that can be explained at, if not fully then in, in good part through the lens of imperialism and uh, even more so I think we we live uh, sort of in an information bubble, which if does not entirely omit, then seriously diminishes the contribution of Russian of the Russian opposition. And if I'm not mistaken, I may be functioning in a worse uh, information bubble than you, but especially conversations about uh, Russian indigenous, decolonial, anti-war movements are entirely missing from the narrative. And many of the Russian partisan tactics, as well as the contributions of Russians in exile, do not exist. And I think, much to our regret, I think that this information vacuum is what creates policies which prevent um, Russian activists at least getting some respite and rest before they return to the trenches, so to speak. Um, thank you so much once again. And right now, I would like to open the floor to questions from you guys, um, I would like to ask that in the inter I'm, I'm sure that there are many questions. In the interest of everybody being heard, if you could keep your questions to two to three minutes maximum and um, sort of make the question clear. And if you have a specific person that you're directing the question to, that you would state to whom the question is directed. So keep it clear and keep it directed to a particular speaker if that's whom you want to hear from. Uh, now the floor is yours. So <clears throat> thank you for your presentations. Uh, I just want to ask, I don't know, it's I guess for both of you, but uh, what about sanctions? Yeah, like this is the most common answer of, I guess, many European and also American uh, governments. So what's your opinion? You know, there is this uh, belief that you make it harder for people, then they will overthrow it. So is, does it sound right for you. I mean, uh, it's, of course, it's a big subject and uh, it depends which sanctions we're talking about, but I don't think that sanctions that are aimed on the ordinary people are really, has anything to do with this war and to stop this war, uh, especially while the countries who are issuing these sanctions are still buying coal, oil and gas from Putin. And as we know that these money from gas, oil and coal are going direct, directly to the Putin's and his guys' pockets, and then it goes directly to finance this war. And I don't see how some other sanctions, uh, except embargo, can in any term affect this situation and i think it's like um, all the statements that we hear like most of them are really hypocritical from the officials from the governments from the politicians because they skip the focus from the real issue and from the real tool that can change the game to the things that can sound like a really populist thing to say but won't change anything so I think we all should push our governments, especially like the, the citizens of Lithuania, Estonia, Baltic countries, to stop buying fossil fuels from Putin and stop like doing this, because this is the main reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't need to convince our governments to do that. 
yes, uh, I think Lithuania has taken the steps with a sort of, uh, uh, what is it called, a tanker that's called um, uh, independence. So we, um, I think that we are there, um, and, uh, but the conversation is very much relevant, and uh, thank you, Lola. Um, others? You told about Estonia's case that they want to stop opportunity to get a visa, but during the news there was also told that there can be exceptions, so have you heard about it? Does it really work and can it help for people who are doing work like you? And maybe another question would be like how we uh, could help those uh, organizations, underground people, if we don't know any contacts of them, don't know any accounts where we could send money, like, how, how can we help if we know only the big uh, charity organizations? Uh, I will answer for the last questions, uh, for the last question first. Uh, I think we can use networking and, for example, people from Lithuanian activist organization can contact somebody from Estonian or Russian organizations and say, can you share a list of where we can donate or which organization needs which help and share it among your platforms? I think that's how it should work, basically, because I don't know. Um, personally, I figure this thing out myself, uh, asking local activists, because media doesn't cover a lot of grassroots projects as it should uh, be in a perfect world, I guess. So I think just, I can send you some links maybe, and you can share it uh, and forward and things like that. And uh, speaking about the exclusions of this visa thing, I think it's like, it sounds right, but it's not really working in real life because for example, Estonia was saying, okay, but if you have relatives in Estonia, they will be no problem to families to, you know, visit and to get visas, or if you have work there or something, but it doesn't work in real life because people's relationships are way more different than the official family thing. For example, okay, I don't have like an official family, but I can go back to my hometown for five months and the only option for me to see my close ones, my friends, who are my actual family, is for them to come to Estonia or to Lithuania and to see me. But, like, we don't have any official status relationship that government sees as a real family or something. So I think it also affects queer people and it also affects people who live in different terms than this official nuclear family stuff, so it doesn't work in real life, so I think it's bullshit. Uh, yes, so uh, I think the situation in, in general with this uh, visa question uh, is like this. So now the EU is going to implement the next uh, set of sanctions. They can't uh, implement the, the, the main thing, the ban for the oil and gas, uh, which is the main question of the, uh, for, the, for the regime uh, in Russia, which is the main issue that can really, uh, you know, influence this, uh, this regime to stop the war. Uh, they already uh, provide most of the possible sanctions. So what, could, what ideas can come in this situation? And then uh, the idea came from the Finnish government, let's ban the, uh, the visas. Let's, uh, you know, play on the, uh, on the this visa, visa issue. And uh, they somehow catch this uh, idea in the situation where uh, after the start of the war, uh, the European Union in general uh, has no any clear kind of line, any clear policy towards the you know the the visa question in general so should should we invite russian dissidents should we invite russian students or we should restrict tourism in some way or another so it was a kind of this very very unclear situation until the moment when this uh, this idea 
uh, this idea to ban the Schengen visa as the new form of sanctions uh, came. Uh, so when it came, uh, I will say that Russian uh, 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 So I will say that uh, uh, Russian propaganda uh, really welcomed this uh, decision, because even from the very beginning of the of the war, as they uh, uh, they were trying to promote this kind of message that well you have uh, spread the uh, Russophobia everywhere, Russian students uh, will be expelled soon from all the European universities and so on and so forth. So the the reason for it is quite simple uh, to. Uh, to uh, promote the situation where uh, we, as Russian citizens, should be in one boat with our with our government. Now they uh, they uh, uh, you know they they uh, they confirmed uh, this uh, this message. That's why I, I think it's absolutely counterproductive and definitely it will not uh, stop. Uh, it it will not help to stop the the war in Ukraine. Thank you, Ria. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lola. Um, yeah, um, I wanted to ask how much uh, the anti-war resistance is concentrated in Moscow and Saint Petersburg, because uh, I mean we all know the you know from the history of Russia, it's usually a very Moscow and Saint Petersburg centered thing, and uh, yeah, and what does you know the rest of the country uh, think about it? And uh, maybe you know I don't know somebody doing something there, uh, like in the in the great beyond. I think it's, of course, uh, in Moscow and St. Petersburg, there are way more activists uh, and activist groups and grassroots uh, initiatives going on because these are the big cities with a lot of resources and a lot of people come here to study and do things. But still, I think sometimes it's like a, a bit made up thing by media, like making us think that only things happen only in Moscow and St. Petersburg. It's not. We have protests all over. We had protests and we still have people going out on streets all over the country. And we still have different uh, initiatives, anti-war initiatives in different regions, even speaking about this uh, partisaning thing with like breaking railways and uh, burning up these uh, army offices. It's not happening only in Moscow and St. Petersburg. It's happening all over the country in different regions. So uh, I think the problem is that media cover coverage is uh, better for St. Petersburg and Moscow because that's how the hierarchical, hierarchical media works. They always want to, you know, make stories about what happened in Moscow, speak to activists they are, that are based in Moscow, St. Petersburg, because it's easier for them, because there are no people and they are themselves based in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And sometimes, not sometimes, but often, always, uh, activists from smaller towns and from regions, they get invisible just because of this hierarchical uh, point of view of media and because they don't have much space in this hierarchy of visibility that is built inside the oppositional movement as well. Because in my opinion, oppositional movement in Russia, like in general, we have leftists there, we have liberals there, we have all kind of people there, but still there is an hierarchy. And there are like the major, the most popular groups and organizations like Navalny and his team, and there are others. and most of the like leftist anarchist grassroots movements are somewhere in the bottom of this visibility and they don't have enough resources they don't have enough donations they don't have enough space because the RQ works like it works <clears throat> yeah so uh, I, I want maybe to to touch this question more uh, like in general so look uh, already russia lost approximately uh, 20000 people in this war uh, it's already much more uh, than uh, than in afghanistan uh, during the soviet invasion for 10 years so 
I think that, in fact, the uh, Russian population didn't, uh, how, how would say, uh, didn't uh, understand the the consequences of uh, of this invasion, and uh, definitely the most of these people who died they came not from uh, Moscow and uh, Saint Petersburg, they came from the most poor, desperate areas of the. Uh, of the country. Uh, these areas, uh, they suffered mostly from the sanctions, the economic sanctions. They, uh, they mostly uh, suffered of, of, the, of, you know, of this uh, invasion from the, uh, from the Russian side. And it's really hard to say in what uh, forms their uh, kind of, uh, their feelings about it will, uh, will come. Uh, there already uh, there are uh, some expectations that uh, so-called mono uh, mono towns, so the, the industrial towns around that uh, around one plant, uh, should be a kind of important uh, possible points uh, points of resistance, uh, strikes, uh, spontaneous uh, protests, and so on. And uh, I think that. Uh, probably to the end of this year, this uh, new type of protest movement, not organized, uh, convinced, uh, you know, anti-war activists, but the ordinary people, the mothers who lost their, uh, their um, sons, uh, the workers who lost their uh, workplaces, uh, and so on. So this kind of uh, protest also will emerge, and uh, it is clear that already uh, the Russian government is is concerned about this situation. So, like uh, like Putin, he uh, he uh, he um, just a week ago he had a special uh, meeting about this uh, mon monotones uh, problem, how to keep uh, the social stability in the, in such places. Uh, so it's it's hundreds hundreds of places among. The, the, the country, uh, there are uh, towns around one big uh, factory. factory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, they like they, they're poor because of the regime, like because the yes. factory were yes. shut. So, yes. so the tension was already there before yes. the war. Yes. Yes. And uh, I perhaps would also like to add the layer of sort of the way we hear, see, and listen in a sense that like because a lot of the soldiers come from. Uh, the regions that we, uh, we have con configured as Asia, uh, the degree to which we do not see orientalized people as fully people and their resistance as real genuine resistance or even the possibility of them meaningfully resisting. So I think that um, on the European side, there's also a wall of prejudice in reporting and in actually hearing the resistance. Um, thank you. Hi. Um, so obviously it's been talked about quite a lot, this kind of disagreement and dispute between Western leftist organizations and Eastern ones around the idea of arming Ukraine or uh, stuff like funding military interventionism or agitating for it. Um, so just to ask, like from a Russian resistance perspective, what should organizations in the West be agitating for, in your view? Mm -hmm. um, because obviously it's pretty hard to get behind fundraising military technology if you have an anti-war stance and is there a historical uh, contingent view in which that's ever helped okay uh, I personally say that um, Ukraine should be armed because I see uh, Russia as a huge monstrous powerful aggressive state which is violating murders people and they have to protect themselves and i have friends who were in the war zone and they were escaping the occupied cities and they were going through the so-called green corridors which were not green at all because they were shot through and these people didn't even have protection for like civilians and some soldiers didn't and for me, like I'm staying in solidarity with people of Ukraine, and I think that we should all stay in solidarity with this. I don't think it is uh, 
a thing where we can say like, oh, militarization is bad, we shouldn't uh, do things like that. And I heard that a lot, even in like leftist communities in Europe. But I don't think it like this approach is working right now where people are dying and they need resources to protect themselves. Um, do you want to add on this? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think in, uh, in the previous uh, panel there was a very, uh, very good uh, contribution by Zofia who, uh, who said that the cancel the Ukrainian debt is, uh, is a very important thing and uh, I, I believe that it's uh, exactly the kind of demand uh, that should be fully supported and promoted by the, uh, by the Western left. But the main uh, problem of the Western left uh, is already uh, we're told here many times uh, is a question of, uh, that they are not uh, not able to to hear the the voices from Ukraine, from Russia, from Eastern Europe and uh, general, and it's uh, it's already a new term, uh, you know, uh, defined West planning uh, that uh, that you can uh, meet like everywhere. Uh, so uh, I think that in the current situation where the international uh, left, uh, especially the Western European left, are totally uh, confused uh, with, uh, with what, what is going with this uh, invasion, uh, they should uh, change their, their attitude. I think it's also really important to do the work of helping refugees all over Europe and in any country right now, because I don't think we should rely on the government in this case, because there is a lack of quality help from the government and people need other humans, not officials, not the institutions to help them. People need a lot of, I don't know, really human contact when like they need time, they need patience and government. And I see it in my daily life, life working, helping refugees, that governments and pro-governmental institutions, they often treat, it was mentioned before here that they objectify refugees, they treat them as numbers, not people, they don't have enough patience to do the work and they don't do enough humanitarian work when you have some time to help people to decide where they want to go, how they want to continue living their life. Uh, uh, like most of the refugees I work with, they have this kind of uh, mood swings because they're traumatized, they have PTSD, and you can meet person who says like, I want to go to Berlin from Estonia to Germany, I have some relatives there, or like other people I know went there, and in a couple of hours, this person will say, no, give me tickets, I want to go back to Mariupol, the destroyed city. And the next day, this person said, no, I will want, like people are in a really terrible state, they're traumatized, they need, and we, I think that we need to rely on ourselves and we need to continue building mutual aid systems because I don't think that the governmental help is effective and is enough human to deal with this problem. And I think it's a large part of the anti-war and maybe even like a post-war work that we need to do for years to heal uh, our society and to help Ukrainian people whose lives was completely destroyed and destinies destroyed and they showed up in different countries with nothing, traumatized, with no money and without anything. I also think it's important to uh, raise money to help these people even though you know that your government helps them financially because this financial help is super tiny and uh, most of the people I work with I know that Vasek can elaborate on that too because she was hosting several families at her place in Nida. Uh, when we see a traumatized family coming from Nikolaev, the heli bombed city in Ukraine, and the mother of four kids needs to do three jobs, two or three jobs to be able to survive, even though she has some kind of financial support from, from the government, but it's not enough to live a life and to raise your three kids. And this person who needs psychological help, she needs to rest, she needs to recover from the war uh, t terror, she needs to do these fucking three jobs and 
get up at 6 a.m. every day to be able to survive. And this is crazy. And I think we need to be super sensitive towards this and help these people out because they get trapped in this circle because they don't have any other options. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And I would like to know when the discussion about solidarity and sanctions is is being discussed uh there is this idea of what's the what's achievable right for instance at the beginning of the war there was the idea of regime change right let's uh close down and push people in order to to force them to change uh, the government right so from your experience what is actually achievable in the maybe the short term right because i know it probably really hard in the long term to what's going to happen but uh, maybe in the short term what it's possible to do right, uh, from from the activism of people Russian people within the, the country uh, so of course it's, it's very hard to you know to predict uh, but um, I think uh, that this war will will be lost from uh, from the side of Russia in one way or another. Uh, it will be definitely continue with some way of, of uh, some kind of negotiations uh, operated by uh, Putin or somebody somebody else, which is also possible uh, even in some near future. Uh, and uh, the uh, the um, uh, the lost uh, in this war will definitely provide some uh, some serious political and social crisis in the country. The main problem is uh, that during this twenty years of of uh, Putinism, as, uh, as as it was explained here. Uh, the whole forms of political and social organization were, uh, you know, constantly destroyed. Yeah, and uh, that really raised the question: what kind of uh, forces uh, could emerge, you know, from this uh, from this crisis? That's why I, I believe the the current uh, anti-war movement. Uh, current leftist movement, even uh, in the underground, uh, even uh, in the immigration, uh, could be a very important and even decisive uh, factor in uh, this uh, this kind of changes. And and that's uh, why uh, it's it's important to support uh, support the Russian um, uh, anti-war movement uh, internationally. I can just add that. Um, in our feminist anti-war resistance movement, we said publicly a lot that like anti-war movements doesn't stop war. It's not the purpose of the anti-war movement. The wars are stopped by the people who are actually doing the wars. The anti-war movements can help to raise a awareness of the people and to mobilize people and to make the aware society grow and in my opinion the aim of the anti-war resistance movement in russia is to build this new society of russia to make it grow to make more people politically active right now and to help them in the situation where they have to risk a lot in their life if they want to be vocal about the war and i think uh what we are doing partly uh are building the system of support inside Russia because now everything is collapsing. NGOs are collapsing. Organizations that used to pull all this social work in Russia are collapsing because, as Ilya said before, that if you are like uh, fighting against domestic violence in Russia and you have an NGO or you have an NGO supporting queer people, government sees you as an enemy because they think that this kind of work is something weird from the West, we don't need it here in Russia, we have traditional kind of stuff going on, and, it, and women's rights are not included, human rights are not inclu included, uh, uh, disabled people rights not included, so 
it was difficult for NGOs to work before the escalation of war, but now it's even worse because all these organizations are getting the status of foreign agents or they get restricted or they get shut down. So right now it's really important to help basically to survive a lot of vulnerable groups inside Russia. So it's not external problem, it's an internal problem as well. At the same time, while we're trying to stop this war and confront what's going on, we at the same time have to do a lot of work not to collapse within our local communities and societies and to, you know, save all the systems of mutual aid that we had before. And like maybe one thing that I wanted to elaborate a bit, like I have it written down, I think it's really important that uh, the violence issue is huge in Russia. And I think understanding how the normalization of violence worked in Russia is really important to understand how did we get in this shitty place of this war going on. Because for the last 22 years, violence in different spheres was constantly normalized by Russian government. And as you may heard, the level of domestic violence in Russia is enormous. We are like top something countries in the world with the terrible domestic violence issues. And we had this law uh, which was decriminalizing uh, domestic violence in the families. Uh, at the same time, we had women's communities, feminist communities, fighting to make a real working law which would protect people from domestic violence. And right now we don't have, I think, any chance. Like, all our, our work is destroyed. For years we fight it for that law, and now it will, I think, it, with Putin it can be approved. Because normalizing violence in the family was also a part in, like, my feminist opinion and other my comrades will agree with me that it is a part of a huge plan it's a part of a huge puzzle because if it is normalized to beat your wife and to know that you can beat your girlfriend to death and nothing will happen to you uh, it is easier to normalize violence against the enemy in the war so if uh, like the violence was normalized inside the country, police violence, police brutality, because we had terrible things with tortures, police tortures, when Russian police officers who are Russian citizens were beating the shit out of other Russian citizens during the peaceful time. And now we know that some part of these police officers, like Rosgvardia, they were also those people who were fighting in Ukraine and who were torturing Ukrainian people. So this was like a constant thing, uh, and Putin is interested in this like culture of violence to be held in Russia, to be praised in Russia, to be glorified in Russia, that this is a normal way to act, that violence is a normal tool to use, no matter if it's inside your family or it is directed to another country or people with another views or another culture or something. And I think this is the key of understanding how it all worked. And I can just name spheres where violence is enormous in Russia, except family and domestic violence uh, issues. Family, uh, the system of jails, because there are terrible tortures going on in Russian jails, and it's not like one, two cases, it's like, it's a system. People get raped, people, people get murdered if they go to jail. Also the violence in the army system and for decades, I mean, like for past 20 years, I know like my friends, like young guys, they were afraid to go to army in the peaceful time because they knew that they might face violence there during this temporary time in the army, in the peaceful time. At the same time, we have violence to toward disabled people in the institutions where people with mental health issues are living. And this whole system of taking care of these people is based on violence and it all was normalized by the government. So I don't like where we all saw these awful pictures from Bucha, from Kramatorsk, where people were tortured, Ukrainian people were tortured by Russian soldiers. I heard people all over the world said, how can a human do such a thing to another human? But I think it's way easier to become a monster and to do such a thing to an enemy 
when you are allowed for years to do such a thing to your own like relatives or people from your city or if you're a policeman to the like people peaceful protesters it is the chain of the events and i think we should be very aware of that yeah and i, I want to add uh, to this that uh, in fact uh, all this um, you know um, legalization of domestic violence uh, this promotion of patriarchy it's a uh, part of the very deep structure of this uh, uh, reactionary semi-fascist uh, ideology because uh, what what is the what, what is the idea behind this uh, legalization of domestic violence is the idea that uh, uh, of the pure sovereignty of the pure the will of the sovereign uh, so you have a family where you have a sovereign which should uh, which should decide in the interests of the members of uh, his family who are not able to decide for themselves and the same you have in the state which is also a kind of big family where you have a leader uh, who is uh, who is like a father uh, who is responsible for everyone and uh, his structural position somehow legalize his unlimited violence against uh, the members of this big family because this violence came not with uh, with uh, anger, let's say, not with hate, but with care. It's a form of uh, of uh, taking care of the members of your uh, your uh, family who are uh, who, who who are not uh, who are not decided by themselves. And uh, when you look into these uh, kind of uh, things, you can reconstruct the kind of uh, kind of ideology behind this uh, behind this regime uh, which uh, which has not exist as the kind of the big ideas you know coming from the from the top uh, you know to the uh, society but spread on the society is a kind of uh, uh, you know something that is uh, obvious something that is organic something as it uh, it should be and uh, this is uh, absolutely not uh, not the unique Russian situation. Mm -hmm. In in Russia, you have just uh, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, reactionary uh, rationalization uh, in its most uh, radical and extreme form. I would also like to add that I am frightened of the backlash of violence that is going to happen in Russia after these soldiers will go back home. And some of them who are not murdered and killed during the war, they will come back home. And these people who were killing Ukrainians in Ukraine, who were torturing them, they will come back home to Russia and they will live among us. They will go to the same shops, they will live at the same buildings, and they will bring this violence home because they will come back as a traumatized people who experienced this war, who experienced and act, like acted this violence, and it will continue, but it will be also against Russian people and the most vulnerable groups like women, women children, older people, queer people, uh, people like indigenous people and everything. It will go it will escalate inside our homes, it will escalate to the streets, and I think it will be another major problem for years. Thank you. Well, not a direct answer to a question. I think this is an unasked question which needed to be answered. Uh, so thank you to you both. Thanks for... Uh, for your contributions and shattering conclusions of some. Um, so I actually wanted to comment on on refugees in our receiving countries and the mutual aid and so on, uh, and also something that Nina uh, said in the morning about Polish people uh, being very welcoming, but uh, slowly, half a year later, yeah, Ukrainian refugees, it's getting, you know, uh, Maybe maybe you should go home. You know this 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 type of effect. Um, uh, yeah, because 
we cannot privatize this uh, completely, right? This is this is great that the Polish society and the Lithuanian society has taken it up uh, on themselves uh, in the spirit of mutual aid and kind of your know, social uh, cooperation. But uh, as we have heard, you know, voices from from a stifling. I, I'm I'm just shocked with the with the level of. Uh, I, I felt it instinctively. That's what it's like in Russia. That, that that the violence is permeating not only the public political level, but it goes down to the level of family and so on. It's it's kind of the vibe. I can feel the vibe. You just confirmed this. Uh, how how hard it is, uh, and it's impossible to demand anything from the system. Obviously, right. But we live, for God's sakes, at least I understand, in Lithuania and Poland, uh, in democratic societies, and we should uh, we should demand more from our our state. We uh, we should go out there, organize ourselves. It is not our job to to be gathering money all the time. We can do that, and I command everyone here doing that. But but we should just go out there and say, treat those refugees, give more money, treat those refugees, and give them psychological help. Organize in bigger groups, put pressure on 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 Twitter as some kind of uh, some kind of organization. We cannot do it as individuals ourselves. This is a kind of a only right. This is a, a, a almost like like uh, yeah, privatization of 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 help. And if there is there is a problem with these refugee visas, we should demand from our uh, governments to to uh, expedite the asylum uh, uh, procedure, be able to quickly recognize who is a dissident and who is not a dissident or some kind of stupid tourist that is harassing Ukrainians on the street, right? We, we are able to do that in our societies. We should appreciate the fact that we are able to do that, organize and uh, put pressure on our governments as much as we can to, you know, as long as we, as we still can do it, right? So that would be my comment and appeal. To everyone uh, here, and the question, uh, I guess, um, uh, to Ilya, which um, concerns also, uh, I'm thinking a lot about this atomization of society that you, that you talked about, uh, that this is a source of, of some, some form of fascism in Russia and a, and a, and a, and a con conclusion or a consequence of this global radicalization of the right. And and that that the uh, Putinism is kind of uh, um, doing it on, on purpose that you split people from their communities and that's how this this effect is going on. And the remedy, from what I hear, from people like Kamil Galeev on on Twitter and kind of another vibe that I'm getting from the uh, Russian society, is consumerism. This is a a, a kind of a, 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 a healing a cool aid, right? For for all that violence, for all that oppression, for all that. Uh, uh, lack of influence, you know, on your own uh, on your own uh, society. What you said: enjoy your private life, enjoy your cars, enjoy Dior, enjoy, you know. Um, do you think that this can be changed? That that the Russian people can, you know, basically go out of that private atomized uh, 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 opium uh, consumerism as an opium for the masses and mobilize? Because I have my doubts whether it's going to happen in my lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> consumerism and and this uh, this um, uh, yeah, so so this um, uh, superiority of the of the of the private uh, of the private life uh, under the uh, the public is uh, I mean it's not just Russian thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's something very. Uh, very general, something uh, even very rooted in the, uh, let's say, in the in the market society. The tendency where everything uh, that is public, that it belonged to the common interest, uh, became uh, some uh, perceived as a something fake, is a something secondary, is a, is a something that uh, not depend on your own uh, active role on your own. Uh, 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 participation and uh, perception of the private uh, as the as the real as as the organic uh, it's 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 very much uh, deep, deeply rooted uh, I don't know in, in bourgeois society in general so you have all this I don't know early Marx who uh, who wrote about it you you have this idea of warrant of the degradation of the uh, of the public sphere and uh, and so on and uh, I, I believe that we, we have this all the time, uh, this kind of 
let's say, double movement, as, as Polanyi once defined it, between the, you know, the aim of people to, to organize themselves, uh, to, uh, to choose some collective forms, uh, solidarity forms of, uh, of their life, uh, and uh, their pure force of, uh, you know, economy, market, uh, and so on, which always try to, to meld the uh, uh, society in, 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 into pieces. And in this sense, I, I, I see this, uh, the, this, this kind of uh, the uh, uh, victory of consumerism, uh, this, uh, this failure of the uh, society in, uh, in Russia as the uh, kind of extreme example what, of what uh, could uh, happen like uh, generally. So, so wh when it will end, it will end in a moment when uh, the Russian people will understand that they can uh, uh, change their life, uh, e even defend their basic rights, their life level, only through the way of the uh, self-organization. That, 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 that's uh, that the only way. <laughs> no, no. no. No, definitely not. And uh, and the other important uh, thing that I want to add to this, that you can see how this uh, kind of imperialist, uh, semi-fascist, you know, view of the uh, of the world, uh, how it directly arises uh, from this uh, individualist, uh, market-oriented, uh, economical uh, understanding of life. Because uh, what the basic kind of ideological structure behind the Putin's uh, foreign policy, that, uh, well, uh, you have the countries uh, who act as the individuals, who act in their own uh, interests. So all uh, that relate to some, uh, uh, you know, common interest things, climate change, uh, global security, uh, system, uh, nuclear disarmament, uh, that, is, uh, that is not real. That is just a fake. That is just a trick of someone uh, to catch his own uh, interest. So uh, that's why uh, Russia should uh, provide its own uh, single interests uh, as other countries do. Yes, yeah, so in, in the sense there, there uh, according to this worldview, uh, there is no difference between the uh, individual behavior and the uh, behavior of, uh, you know, global powers. And, and that is very much, uh, you know, understandable for, for, many, uh, for many Russians who already prepared for such imperialist uh, uh, ideology by uh, their uh, daily life, <laughs> you know, organized uh, absolutely uh, according to this neoliberal uh, principles of the uh, pure self-interest. Thank you. Oh, hi, um, thank you. Uh, well, I have a uh, probably personal question and um, how do you cope uh, in your work uh, here um, with um, many emo emotional uh, issues, uh, uh, like burnouts uh, or lack of uh, intimacy or lack of uh, communication with uh, close friends and uh, I, don't, I don't know, just uh, a lack of proximity to the people that you um, I don't know. Like you are, <laughs> you you need to be with you, and how probably you have experience of um, um, mutual aid in this uh, kind of um, milieu, like with uh, to all to, to uh, your co -act activists uh, for for the members of feminist anti-war resistance, or, and also for um, Ukrainians, uh, uh, like mostly Ukrainian women who uh, went like fled the war with the war with the children and like hus husbands brothers fathers uh, mothers uh, and whatever like friends they either uh, stayed in ukraine or they went to other place because everybody went to different places so this um, uh, the the fact of uh, of communities being scattered around many uh, different places so do you have some sort of experience in uh, um, uh, co 
coping mechanisms or some strategies uh, how you um, yeah how you help each other and how you uh, uh, keep the connections still present because it's quite difficult like working all the time to uh, any like I don't know like cleaning things for uh, Lithuanian restaurants or helping other <laughs> Ukrainian refugees to get to Lithuania it's like no well it absorbs all the time and all the emotional um, uh, I don't know landscape so do you have uh, this I don't know field of work in, in, in your sense? I can say, thank you for your question, I can say that um, in feminist uh, anti-war resistance movement we organize a network of uh, counselors and psychologists who provide free help uh, to the people who are in need of this help. Uh, it's uh, mostly Russian activists, but basically anyone can apply and get help. Uh, it's also Ukrainian people, and I think that... Um, in Russia, it's mostly like also on a grassroots level in terms of help of uh, like psychological help to the activists because the burnouts and the stress and the anxiety, the level is outrageous. And I think most of the people are facing these problems and most of the people don't actually get help because most of the people are not used to getting psychological help because it was, you know, underestimated in Russia for a long period of time. And some people have this feeling like, oh, okay, I'm not a Ukrainian person, I don't need this because I am like, bombs are not flying above my head and people are, a lot, a, a lot of people are underestimating the psychological effects of how this reality uh, affects their mental state and their ability to continue to resist and uh, to do the activist work and we are trying to raise awareness about it and we are trying to build a network of people who are ready to provide help. We are also doing different materials uh, about how can you help yourself to lower this level of anxiety, to figure out what kind of uh, mental state you are in right now, what kind of help you might need, like to do maybe baby steps to do something to help yourself, to get in a more like healthy lifestyle to say so during all these shitty crazy events and I know that there are a lot of international organizations who are providing psychological help to Ukrainian people and they have Ukrainian speaking counselors and who are precisely working with the people with the experience of war traumas and seeing different awful uh, violent events and I think it's really important to invite professionals to do this work because 100% this kind of work, it's not the kind of work that people with no experience can do, especially when we're speaking about the people who survived violence and who've been in the war, to the war zones and they've seen all these dead bodies and they've seen their close ones die, so they need a really good quality professional help. Uh, I also thought that maybe it's like, in terms of seeing close ones, it's a hard thing, I think, for every, like most of the Russian anti-war activists in exile, because all of the people and all of the communities got separated, because when the war has started, people started going where they could, and it wasn't possible to go and to cooperate and go to the one place, so all the activists from my group and all of my friends are, like, most of them are in Russia still, but others are in completely different cities and countries, and it's really hard to like communicate but we still are able to do this and i think mm, it's stupid to say but like pandemic awful two years we was able to learn how to keep these connections going and how to network effectively while we can see each other offline so we're still using these tools and these like strategies to keep going and i think it's the only way yeah that's it Thank you so much, everybody, for your very insightful questions. And uh, let us give us uh, a round of applause to Lola and Elia. <laughs> I'm aware that there may be questions that are still outstanding, and I invite you to find both Lola and Elia around and have dinner with them, have uh, extend the conversations further.